Hi, and welcome to lesson two in our reactions unit. Here in lesson two, we're going to start to investigate different types of reactions. And we're gonna look at reactions that are known as oxidation and reduction reactions, also known as redox reactions, which is of course why I have my friend Leo the Lion here, as he of course says, grr. If you don't know what that means, please make sure that you ask me about it at some point in the not too distant future. And we can discuss why Leo the Lion says grr for the purpose of redox reactions. Let's go in and take a look. Redox reactions involve an exchange of electrons. Reactions are always going to take place due to some sort of driving force. And in a redox reaction, that driving force is the transfer of electrons from one atom to another atom. This is where the term redox comes from. Reduction is the gain of electrons and oxidation is the loss of electrons. So put them together and you wind up with redox. Over the course of a redox reaction, an element in a substance is going to gain electrons and an element in a substance is going to lose electrons. And we need to be able to see that happening. And the way that we do that is by using a device that we've already introduced in our course, the oxidation numbers of elements. More electronegative atoms will gain electrons, they'll become reduced. And so when they do that, their oxidation number will decrease. If you're gaining electrons, you're becoming more negative, so your oxidation number goes down. Less electronegative atoms will lose electrons, they'll be oxidized. And so their oxidation numbers will go up because they become less negative. So by looking at the oxidation states for elements over the course of a reaction, we can determine whether or not it's a redox reaction based on whether or not the oxidation number numbers are changing. It's also important to understand that in a redox reaction, both reduction and oxidation have to happen. You can't take electrons off of something if you don't give those electrons to something else. So we're going to see one substance gaining electrons and its oxidation number decreasing and another substance losing electrons and its oxidation number increasing. That's how we'll know that we're looking at a redox reaction. There certainly can also be substances that neither gain nor lose electrons over the course of a redox reaction. And that's what we call spectator ions. So any substance that does not have a change in its oxidation state would be known as a spectator ion because it's just basically there. It's not participating in the reaction, so it's like a spectator at a sporting event, I suppose. Before we get into looking at the individual types of redox reactions, we need to be able to determine the oxidation states of elements in compounds. We've already dealt with this a little bit when we talked about naming and formulating compounds, but let's go in and formalize the rules that we're going to use. The first rule is that any element by itself has an oxidation state of zero. Even if it's a Brinkelhoff element and it's in pairs, if it's by itself, it's got an oxidation state of zero. The second rule is that any ion will have an oxidation state that's equal to the charge of that ion, which is pretty self-explanatory and is basically nothing new for us. The third rule is that the sum of the oxidation states of elements in a compound must either equal zero if that compound is electrically neutral, and we've already used that for formulating and naming ions and molecular substances, or if that compound is an ion, like a polyatomic ion, then the sum of the oxidation states has to equal the overall ionic charge in the compound. And finally, when we're talking about molecular substances, the more electronegative atom will have the negative oxidation state, and the less electronegative atom will have the positive oxidation state. We'll talk about oxidation states again later on in this course when we talk about electrochemistry, and at that point, we'll expand these rules. But for right now, these are all the rules that you need in order to determine whether or not a reaction is a redox reaction. Let's try a few examples of figuring out the oxidation states of all of the atoms in different compounds. Here are three different compounds. I'd like you to try to figure out the oxidation states of every element in each of these compounds. Pause the video, try it on your own, and then when you're ready, we'll go through the solutions for each one in turn. So let's do oxygen first. If you remember from rule one, any element by itself has an oxidation state of zero. So the oxidation state of oxygen in O2 is zero. Remember that even elements that occur in pairs, the Brinkelhoff elements, will still be assigned a zero if the substance only consists of that element by itself. Looking at K2CRO4, things get a little bit more tricky. So let's go through this in turn. We know the sum of potassium and chromium and oxygen has to add up to zero. Knowing that, we can actually start to work our way through the substance. We probably wanna look at our periodic table in order to figure out the possible 
oxidation states that these different elements can have. Oxygen is going to be negative two, and since we have four of them, it's gonna be a total of negative eight. This may be a little confusing to you. The reason why oxygen is negative two is because it's the only non-metal in the compound, so it has to have a negative oxidation state. The two metals in the compound, potassium and chromium, are both going to have positive oxidation states. Now that we know that oxygen is supplying a total value of negative eight, we know that potassium and chromium have to be supplying a total value of positive eight in order to equal zero. Going to the periodic table, we see that potassium has to be positive one. And since there are two of them, that's positive two. And now to figure out chromium, which has a lot of possible positive oxidation states, we can just do the math. Plus two plus chromium plus negative eight has to equal zero. Solving for chromium by itself, we determine that chromium is positive six. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, write down any questions that you have, and then we'll move on to the next one. CH3OH is all non-metals, which is gonna make things a little bit trickier, but it's still totally doable. So let's go in and take a look. The first thing that I've done here is that I've grouped all of the atoms by themselves. So I've got C plus H4 plus O, and that's gonna all add up to zero because it has to, the sum has to be zero. Going through things, we see that oxygen is negative two and there's one oxygen, so that's a total of negative two. If we look at our periodic tables for carbon and hydrogen, we can see that carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. So carbon is going to be negative and hydrogen is going to be positive. Hydrogen has to be plus one. That's the only positive oxidation state that we're allowed to give it. So that's gonna be a total of positive four. And then using the same thing that we did for chromium in our previous example, we're going to sum those two together in order to figure out what carbon has to be to bring the overall compound back up to zero. When we do that, we see that carbon in this particular case is negative two. This adds to zero. And so these are the correct oxidation states for all of the elements in this compound. Again, if you have any questions about this, write it down before we go in and talk about the different types of redox reactions. We've talked about this before, but just as a quick reminder, there is a difference between oxidation state and charge. Oxidation state is a theoretical device that we use in order to track electron ownership in any compound, covalent compounds included. Ionic charge is a real phenomenon that atoms take on when they gain or lose electrons in ionic bonds. Of course, ionically charged substances do have oxidation states that are equal to that ionic charge. We do write them slightly differently. So for oxidation states, we write the sign and then the number first. And for ionic charges, we write the number and then the sign. That said, I don't really care if you keep that straight in your head or not. It's really not a big deal. We use oxidation states and ionic charges exactly the same way. And I don't really care if you keep track of the fine difference between how we write them or not. In the second part of this lesson, we're gonna look at four different types of redox reactions. The first is what we call a synthesis reaction. In a synthesis reaction, two substances are gonna be put together to make a more complex substance. Synthesis reactions have the general formula A plus B yields AB. A goes from zero to some positive value, so it's oxidized, and B goes from zero to some negative value, so it's reduced. Here's a classic example, hydrogen, gas plus oxygen gas yielding water. You can see that the hydrogen is oxidized and the oxygen is reduced when they combine to make water. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, write down any questions that you have and then we'll move on. The opposite of a synthesis reaction is a decomposition reaction. In a decomposition reaction, a more complex substance is broken down into two or more simpler substances. The general formula for a decomposition reaction would be something like this, where CD yields C plus D. D is going from a negative value to zero, so it's oxidized, and C is going from a positive value to zero, so it's reduced. Our example decomposition reaction is the decomposition of magnesium chloride into magnesium and chlorine. You can see that chlorine is oxidized from the chloride ion into chlorine gas, and magnesium is reduced from the magnesium ion into just pure elemental magnesium. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, write down any questions that you have, and then we'll move on. A little bit more complicated are what are called the single replacement reactions. In a single replacement reaction, one element is going to take the place of another element in a compound. If the element that is doing the replacing is a metal, then the single replacement reaction is going to look like this, where A is taking the place of some other metal B. In this case, A is oxidized from zero to a positive state in the compound, and B is reduced. The other option for a single replacement reaction is where A is a non-metal. In this case, A is taking the place of C. And so in this case, C is oxidized and A is reduced. So these are slightly different, but in both cases, one substance is taking the place of another substance in a compound. 
which is why it's called a single replacement reaction. Of course, if you notice, in both of these cases, we have a substance, X in the case of type 1 and Y in the case of type 2, whose oxidation states do not change. If you remember back to what we talked about at the start of this lesson, that's what we call spectator ions. And that's true of all single replacement reactions. We will get spectator ions who do not participate in the redox reaction. Looking at examples of single replacement reactions for type one, I'm showing you the replacement of hydrogen and hydrogen chloride by zinc to produce hydrogen gas and zinc chloride. In this case, zinc is oxidized and hydrogen is reduced. In our type two example, we've got fluorine taking the place of chlorine and potassium chloride. So chlorine is oxidized and fluorine is reduced. In both of these cases, we also have spectator ions, the chloride ion in our first example and the potassium ion in our second example. Our final type of redox reaction is what's known as a combustion reaction. And so in a combustion reaction, for our purpose, an organic molecule is going to be combined with oxygen to produce water and carbon dioxide. In reality, it doesn't actually always have to be an organic molecule. Hydrogen easily undergoes combustion, for instance, but for us, you'll always see it as an organic molecule combined with oxygen to produce water and carbon dioxide. Organic molecules will always have carbon and hydrogen at some number in them, and they may have additional atoms as well. But if you ever have a covalent substance with carbon and hydrogen covalently bonded in it, that is an organic compound. So the way I've written it here, just to symbolize that it really could be any number of carbons and hydrogens, is CXHY. We're combining that with oxygen to produce CO2 and H2O. So I didn't balance it because we don't know what the molecular formula of the organic compound is but we can still see what's happening in the redox reaction. Carbon is being oxidized from negative four to plus four in our compound, and oxygen is being reduced from zero to negative two in carbon dioxide and in water both. Hydrogen is neither being oxidized nor reduced, though it's not really correct to call it a spectator ion because at no point in the reaction does it exist as an ion. A good example of this is the combustion of methane, a reaction that was actually shown at the start of our first lesson in this unit. Methane is CH4, so when we combine CH4 with oxygen, we'll need two oxygens. We'll produce one CO2 molecule and two H2O molecules. Carbon is being oxidized from negative four to plus four, and oxygen is being reduced from zero to negative two in both cases. Does this make sense? If it doesn't, write down any questions that you have before we wrap up. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of redox reactions. Make sure that you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can determine the oxidation states of all elements in a compound. If you're given a compound, you should at this point be able to determine the oxidation states of the elements in that substance. Also make sure that you can recognize synthesis, decomposition, single replacement, and combustion reactions if you're given examples of them on things like tests and quizzes. Finally, make sure that you can determine the oxidized and reduced species over the course of a redox reaction and identify any spectator ions. Remember, if the oxidation number of a substance goes up over the course of a reaction, it is being oxidized. If it goes down, it's being reduced, and if it doesn't change, it's a spectator. If you can do all these things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them in the comments below the video or get in touch with me. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.